New post-war Old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Don't move, any of you. Don, where'd you get that gun? Never mind, just don't make me use it. Don't be a fool, Don. I'm not. I'm going out of here and nobody's gonna... Don't be too sure. <laughs> Nick! Anybody else want to try any smart tricks before I leave? Now, the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. In the back booth of a dingy bar in the slum district, a well-dressed young man takes a thick package of banknotes from his pocket and passes it across the cigarette-scarred table to the shifty-eyed little man who sits across from him. That's every cent I have in the world, Whitey. Six thousand dollars. I said ten. Where's the other four grand? I couldn't get any more. You better get it. Remember that letter I told you about? If anything happens to me, it'll be in the hands of the DA within 24 hours. That'll be the end of you. But why? I'll meet you here tomorrow night and you... I can't come here again, Whitey. If anyone should okay, say that... Okay, okay. I'll phone you at the office, tell you where to bring it. But why do I... I get the other four grand tomorrow night, or I go to the cops, and you go to the electric chair for murder. Don, if there were any way I could raise the money for you, I would. You know that. Oh, I know, Chris. I, I wouldn't have asked you, except I've tried everything else. You're the only real friend I've got. Sure. <laughs> now, when you need me, I can't come through. Oh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Whitey phoned me about an hour ago. I promised to have the money at the corner of First and Water Streets at 1 o'clock tonight. I've got to have it there. But why, Don? What's he got on you? You can tell me. No, Chris, I... I don't want to talk about that. But if Whitey ever tells the cops who I really am, it's the end of everything. And that little rat's got me tied hand and foot. You mean that letter to the district attorney? Yes, but... Chris. Chris, do you think you could be lying about that letter? If I thought now, that... Now, Don, you're not getting any crazy ideas, are you? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm thinking. There's only one chance left. Yeah? Mr. Hughes gets back from Washington at 11 tonight. Nah, you'll never get him to part with $4,000. If I know our beloved employer, he'll never... But he's just... got to. It's my last hope. Yeah, what if he won't? Then I'll be waiting for Whitey just the same. And it'll be a meeting he'll never forget. Oh, it's you, sonny boy. So dark in that doorway, I couldn't see you. Okay, where's the four grand? It's right here. Oh, no, you don't. Let go of that gun. Try and double-cross me with it. You... Oh, hi, Nick. Hello, Patsy. Good morning, Sergeant Matheson. Uh, Mr. Hughes, this is Nick Carter and Patsy Bowen. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Hughes. And thank goodness you're here at last. At last? Oh, Mr. Hughes, it's been exactly 17 minutes since Sergeant Matheson phoned and asked us to come down here to your office. I haven't even had my breakfast yet. What's this all about? Mr. Carter, my firm publishes children's and religious books. A notoriety, scandal, unfavorable publicity, anything like that can ruin us. Um, you see, Nick, there was a murder in the waterfront district last night. Cheap little two-bit crook named Whitey Gear was shot to death. We found this slip of paper on Whitey's body. What? Why, that looks like one of those slips of paper they have in phone booths for people to write phone numbers on. That's what it is, Patsy. Hmm. What's the connection, Matty? The phone number written on that paper is the number of the Hughes Publishing House. Oh, I see. Oh, hey, there's something else written here, too. Don Mason, 1 a.m., 1st Avenue and Water Street. Right. And Whitey was found dead at the corner of 1st and Water, shot to death about 1 a.m., according to the medical examiner. So Don Mason... Now, wait a minute. Is... 
Who is this Don Mason? Oh, that, Mr. Carter, is the crux of the whole thing. Don Mason is my sales manager, and he's engaged to my daughter. Oh, I see. And you think Mason kept the appointment with Whitey and murdered him, huh? Well, of course, don't you? I wouldn't know, Matty. This slip of paper with Mason's name on it certainly doesn't convince me. Well, I don't get you. From what you tell me, I doubt that Whitey was the kind of man who'd make a memorandum about anything. Oh, phooey. He did it this time, and that's all I care about, Nick. Maybe. Look, Matty, has anybody else handled this piece of paper except you and me? I know. I took it off the bottom myself. What? Then let's put it in an envelope and see that no one else does touch it. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, if you want to. Uh, But there's another thing, Nick. Yeah? Whitey was a skinny little runt, but from the looks of things, he must have put up a whale of a fight before he was killed. We found a couple of gray wool threads under his fingernails, like from a gray tweed coat. And Whitey's coat was brown. Oh. Then you think those threads came from the killer's coat during the struggle. Sure, Patsy. What else? Uh And uh, Mr. Hughes here tells me Don Mason wears a gray tweed coat. And so do lots of other people, Matty. You must understand, Mr. Carter, this company simply cannot afford to have one of its executives accused of murder. Now, I want you to prove that Don had nothing to do with this, this whitey person. But what if he did have? Well, well, then we'll publicize the fact that Hughes Publishing hired the best detective it could get to see justice done, even though the culprit is one of our own executives. Now, uh, that may help some. Well, how about it, Carter? Before I give you an answer, Mr. Hughes, I'd like to talk this over with Don Mason. He hasn't come down to the office yet, Nick. I was just waiting for you to get here before going over to his apartment after him. A good idea, Matty, except that he may leave for the office before we get to his place. Oh, I have an idea. Don shares an apartment with my star salesman, Chris Bentley. I could phone Chris down to keep Don there until you arrive. Yeah, I suppose you do that, Mr. Hughes. And unless he's got a mighty good alibi, that young fella's going to move to another apartment. A small one in the city jail. <laughs> Don. Don, uh, wake up. Oh, you Wake up, you dope. Snap out of it. Uh-huh. Oh, good morning, Chris. What's the matter? Old man Hughes just phoned that some people are coming to see you. He says to tell you to wait here until they arrive. Okay. Oh, I feel terrible. Don, where were you last night? Huh? Get with it, Don. You, you didn't get in until after I went to bed, and that was 3 o'clock. Where were you? Oh, I... What? I don't know. I can't remember. Did you get the money from old man Hughes? Money? What money? The money to pay off that blackmailer. Did you get it? Good grief, Whitey. Yes, Whitey. Did you see him? I I can't remember whether I did or not. You mean you had another one of those blackouts? I, I guess I must have. Now, let's see. I remember eating dinner here at the apartment with you. Yes, and afterwards I went out for a pack of cigarettes. But when I came back, you were gone. And so is that gun you keep in your dresser drawer. What? Oh, Chris, no. What did you do, Don? Why'd you take the gun? You, you, you've got to remember. Oh, I, I can't. I can't remember anything. I went all over town looking for you, but you just disappeared. Oh, from the way my head feels, I'd, I'd think I must have been in some bar, but, but I don't drink. Wait a minute. What are you doing? Looking for your gun. Yeah, here it is in the pocket of your top coat. And Don, three bullets have been fired from it. What do you mean, three bullets? It wasn't even loaded last time I saw it. Well, it is now. Don, are you sure you didn't meet that whitey fella? Oh, I I don't know. I I can't remember. Hey, hey, maybe it's the police who are coming here. Maybe whitey turned me in. No, 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 get hold of yourself. We haven't much time. What are you doing now? I'm putting the gun on this little shelf over the door in the coat closet. Not much of a hiding place, but it'll have to do until we can get rid of it. Chris, I won't let you get mixed up in this. Now, don't be silly. Now, get this. You never even heard of this whitey person. You were here all last night. You never left the apartment, understand? Yeah, yeah. I never left the apartment. After dinner, you and I played gin rummy and listened to the radio until 3 a.m., and then we went to bed. You were here all last night. And I'll swear to it. (laughs) 
And you still say you didn't meet Whitey Gear at the corner of First and Water Streets last night, Mason? No, I never even heard of the guy, Sergeant. Then how come he had your name and phone number? I don't know. Can you prove where you were at 1 o'clock, Don? I was right here in the apartment. That's right, Mr. Carter. Don never stepped outside all last night. You'll swear to that? What? Well, sure I will. We played gin rummy until 3 a.m. Well, that sounds like a pretty good alibi, Sergeant. Yeah, if it holds up. Frankly, Don, you don't look as though you'd spent a quiet evening at home. I'd say you were suffering from a pretty bad hangover. Well, I... I Mason, I, Whitey Gear was killed with a thirty-eight revolver. You own such a gun? No. You own a gray tweed coat? Yeah. Why? Where is it? Well, it's in the closet, but I... All right. Don! Uh, oh, darling, Daddy said you were in some kind of now, trouble. Don isn't in any trouble, Betty. No, honey, it, it's all right. Hey, wait a minute. Who's this? It's Betty Hughes, Don's fiancée. Say, you're looking fine, Betty. That's a new hairdo, isn't it? Of course not, Chris. But what did Daddy mean I by... I guess it's just because I haven't seen you for so long. What are you talking about? You saw me only last night. But what was that? Chris came over to my house last night looking for Don. He said Don had disappeared and he thought... Uh, well... Don, something is wrong. Oh, you are in trouble, aren't you? You bet he is, Miss Hughes. So he was with you every minute last night, was he, Chris? Well, I, uh... Now, now look, Sergeant, I'll no... talk to you later. Get your hat, Don. I'm taking you in for the murder of Whitey Gear. Now, Matty, are you sure you have enough of a case to justify an arrest? You bet I have, Nick. Why would he frame a phony alibi if he wasn't guilty? Oh, Chris, if I'd only known... I tried to tip you off, Betty, but I guess I was pretty clumsy about it. You ready, Don? Yeah, I got my hat. And I got this! Oh, where'd you get that gun? Never mind. Just don't make me use it. Because if I do, somebody's gonna get hurt. <laughs> Unmindful of the fact that his action is practically a confession of guilt, Don stands near the door, holding Nick, Matty, and the others at the point of his gun. In just a moment, we'll see what happens next. Now back to the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Holding Nick, Matty, and the others at the point of his gun, Don stands beside the door to the inner room of the two-room apartment he shares with Chris. Now, get into the bedroom, all of you. Let's do as he says, Matty. No use anyone getting shot. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Carter. I want to be sure nobody's going to... Oh, don't be too sure. Hey! Hey! Keep your hand away from your gun, Sergeant. Okay, okay. You hurt, Nick? No. Just got the wind knocked out of me. It went down through me. That was quite a stunt, Don. I, I was a commando in the war. Now... Anyone else want to try any smart tricks before I leave? You're playing this awful dumb, kid. I'm playing it the only way I can. Now I'm going to lock this bedroom door. And then I'm getting out of here. And heaven help anyone who tries to follow me. So you both just stood there and let him walk out, did you? A fine pair of detectives you turned out to be. They didn't just stand there. As soon as they heard the outside door close, Nick and Sergeant Matheson were after him. Yeah, but by the time we got the door unlocked, he was out of sight. But he left his wallet on the dresser, along with some small chains, keys, and so on. He won't get far without a cent in his pocket. Yeah, he left that gray tweed coat, too. I sent it down to the police lab. And if those threads under Whitey Gear's fingernails came from that coat, we'll know it in a couple of hours, Nick. Mm, that young scoundrel... When I think of all I did for him... What did you do for Don, Mr. Hughes? Why, well, I gave him a job, didn't I? He even promoted him to be sales manager when he wasn't in line for the job, simply because Betty was in love with him. Well, I guess she sees a mistake now. I doubt it. When a girl's in love... Oh, love, fiddlesticks. Before he came along, it was Chris. For him, somebody else. How long has Don worked for you? Ever since he came here from Toronto, 1942. He was just out of the Canadian Army. I thought I was being patriotic by helping a disabled veteran. Disabled? Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't anything disabled about the way he threw me clear across that room. It was, it was a head wound. That's why they discharged him from the army. He used to have periods when he'd black out completely. He couldn't remember where he'd been or what he'd done for hours at a time, even days. That hasn't happened for a year or so now. Well, according to Chris, it happened last night. That's why Chris tried to give him an alibi. He said whatever Don did, he wasn't responsible. Oh, the guy's just getting ready for a plea of temporary insanity, Nick. But he won't get away with it. Maybe he will, Matty. Unless you can prove a motive. I'll prove the motive. Don't you worry about that. Mm, it seems to me the first thing you've got to do is, is catch him. Yeah, well, I'll do that, too. 
Every cop in town is on the lookout for him. And five will get you ten. We have him rounded up inside of 24 hours. Hello? Betty? Don. Oh, Don, is that you? Yes. Are you alone? Yes. Oh, darling, where are you? Never mind. Betty, I need help. And I don't dare try to get in touch with Chris. The cops are sure to be watching the apartment. If there's anything I can do. There is. I've got to have some money so I can get out of town. A couple of hundred dollars. I'll get it. I'll bring it to you. No, no, I, I won't let you take any chances. Give the money to Chris. Tell him I'll be waiting in the freight yards at the foot of 68th Street at midnight. Hey, Nick. Nick, we've got it. Got what, Matty? The only thing that was missing in this case, the motive. Look at this letter. Who's it from, Sergeant? From Whitey Gear, that's who. Whitey. Yeah, let's see. Here you are. He was afraid Don might try to knock him off, so he left this with a friend to be mailed to the district attorney in case anything happened to him. <laughs> DA got it in the mail about an hour ago. What are those newspaper clippings, Nick? I don't know yet. A dated Portland, Oregon, 1939. It's all there. Even a picture of Don Mason. <laughs> His real name is Jimmy Burke, and he's wanted for murder. Murder? Yeah, Patsy. He was mixed up with a juvenile gang in Portland that robbed a warehouse and shot the night watchman. And Don was the one who killed him? That's what this clipping says. Oh. The gun that killed the watchman was positively identified as belonging to Don. He must have escaped into Canada and joined the army there under the name of Mason, huh? You wire Portland for confirmation, Matty? Sure, sure I did. No answer yet, Nick. Hey. Hmm? Look at the handwriting on this note that was with the clippings. What about it? Well, that's Whitey Gear's handwriting. At least his name is signed to it. So what? Well, it's nothing like the handwriting on that memo you found in his pocket. Why, Nick, you're right. Hey, maybe Don wrote down the time and place he wanted to meet Whitey and then gave it to him. No, no, I don't think so, Matty. I have a hunch that memo was planted. Yeah? Well, the laboratory boys tested those gray threads under Whitey's fingernails, Nick, and they're definitely from Don Mason's coat. It's an airtight case. Yeah, sure. You seem to have everything except a prisoner. Uh, <clears throat> you haven't found any trace of Don yet, have you? No, no. He won't make a move until after dark. But like you said, he's got to have money. Probably he'll try to get it from Chris. And I've got all my men around that apartment. I don't think he'll go back to the apartment, Matty. What? My hunch is he'll try to contact Betty Hughes. Hey, maybe you're right. Well, I'll just plant some of the boys around the Hughes house, too. You won't have to, and Matty. I phoned Waldo McGlynn. He's watching the place now. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> then we got him, no matter which way he jumps. Oh, I think I'll go on home, Nick. It's been a long day. Yeah, it's almost midnight. I know, but I wanted to stick around the office. Oh, hold it. Nick Carter speaking. Oh, Waldo. Huh? What? I see. Where'd she meet him? Betty met Don somewhere? No, she met Chris. Uh oh Where? Why, that's the freight yard. Nick, what's happened? Good boy, Walter. We'll get right on it. Nick, what is it? Betty just met Chris in a cafeteria on the east side and gave him a roll of bills. The getaway money for Don. That's what Waldo figured, so he trailed Chris out of the cafeteria and heard him tell a cab driver he wanted to go to the foot of 68th Street. So that's what you meant when you said the freight yards. Yeah. Chris just left a couple of minutes ago. If we hurry, maybe we can get there first. <laughs> was Chris ahead of us. I know it was. Yeah, I got a good look at him when he passed under the light. Where'd he go to? Maybe he went around the other side of this boxcar. We have a couple of hundred boxcars in this part of the yards. You can stop right where you are, Carter. Don! Thank heaven we found you, Don. I was afraid you'd... Save it. Chris? Yeah, Don? Get his gun. Okay. Now, wait a minute, Chris. You're in trouble already. You help him now, that's going to make you equally guilty. Well, what can I do, Mr. Carter? Don's making me do this at the point of a gun. Aren't you, Don? Sure I am. You got it? You bet. Don, listen to me. Don't be a fool. You give yourself up, I think I can prove your innocence. Innocent? But I, I'm not. I killed Whitey because he was blackmailing me. I must have. Do you remember killing him? Oh, no. I don't remember anything that happened last night, but... I, I... don't think you did kill him, Don. 
In fact, I'm positive you didn't. Don't listen to him, Don. It's a trick. Look, Don, there's only one person who knew where and when you were going to meet Whitey. Only one person who could have drugged you. Drugged me? Yes, drugged you. That's why you thought you had a hangover this morning. So that's it. This person drugged you, then kept your appointment with Whitey wearing your gray tweed coat. Chris, it was you who... Okay, it... let's quit playing games. You drop met your gun, Whitey. Don. You met Whitey and you killed him. If you him. don't drop your gun, stupid, I'm going to use this gun I took from Carter. Okay. Now you're being sensible. But, but I don't get it. You were my friend. I trusted sure, you. Sure, I was your friend. I didn't mind a bit when you got the sales manager job I should have had. And I was tickled to death when you took my girl away from so me. So that's it. Sure. With you out of the way, I'll be the new sales manager. And I'll be the boss's son-in-law, too. Someday I'll own the whole business. You're going to have to work awfully fast to do all that before you go to the chair for killing Whitey, aren't you, Chris? Who's going to send me to the chair? Not any of you three. Because when Carter and Don get through fighting it out, I'm afraid there won't be any survivors. What are you talking about? It'll be easy, Carter. I've got your gun to shoot Don with, and then I'll take his gun to finish off you and Miss Bowen. Chris, Chris, you're crazy. The cops will think Carter tried to arrest you, and you shot it out. Why, that's ridiculous. Someone will hear the shot. That freight engine is going to pass on the other side of this boxcar in a few seconds. It'll make enough noise to cover anything, even gunshots. <laughs> With a passing freight engine to cover the sound of gunfire, Chris's finger tightens on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. In the freight yards at the foot of 68th Street, Chris Bentley is holding Nick, Patsy, and Don Mason at the point of a gun waiting only for the noise of an approaching engine to cover the sound of his shot before he fires. Here's the engine. So get ready. You first, Don, old pal. Hold it, Chris. Nick, it's Sergeant Matheson. Unless you want me to point this Tommy gun lower the next time. About time you got here, Matty. I started as soon as I got your phone call, Nick. You're not going to take me in? Nick, he's getting away. Not so fast, chum. <laughs> Uh, there. That'll hold you for a while. Good work, Don. Holy mackerel, Don. What did you do to it? Didn't you recognize that stunt, Matty? It's the same one I used on me. And I can tell you from experience that Chris isn't going to do any more running away. Not for a minute or two. Well, I can't thank you enough for what you did, Nick. But, well, I guess it wasn't much use. They'll only send me back to Oregon to stand trial for, for the killing that night, killing the night watchman back in 39. Oh, no, they won't, Don. Sergeant Matheson wired the Oregon police about you, and they wired back that the charge had been dropped. That's right, uh, Don. About a year later, the real killer was caught, and he confessed. For the love of Pete. You were completely cleared. But if Chris wanted to get rid of me, why did he kill Whitey to do it? Well, for all he knew, he only had to sit tight and let Whitey turn me in. He said you were going to Mr. Hughes for the money, and he was afraid you might get it. And he couldn't turn you in himself because you wouldn't tell him what Whitey had on you, or even what your real name was. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But even after he killed Whitey to make sure the DA got that letter, Chris tried to give me an alibi. Oh, it, it just doesn't make sense. Well, that was only a part of his scheme to put himself in a good light with Betty Hughes. He knew that alibi wouldn't stand up. In fact, he made sure it wouldn't stand up by going to a dozen places looking for you. He knew someone would remember that he'd said you disappeared and couldn't be found. And to think you figured the whole thing out from that piece of paper with my name on it, and the time, and the place where I was supposed to meet Whitey. Oh, just a minute, Don. That's not quite true. That slip of paper looked a bit phony to me, but that was all. When Chris tried to incriminate you by putting that piece of paper in Whitey's pocket, he was actually furnishing the evidence that was going to convict him. What? Well, well, how do you mean? He forgot a very important thing. Fingerprints. Fingerprints? Yes, Whitey's fingerprints weren't on that paper, so obviously he couldn't have written it. But Chris's fingerprints were all over it. Wow, he did forget something important, didn't he? Uh-huh. But, uh, say, Nick, you didn't know about those things until an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Why were you so sure Don was innocent? I became convinced the minute he threw me across the room at his apartment. What'd that have to do with it? Well, Whitey was a scrawny little fellow. Yet, Matty said he put up quite a fight before he was killed. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. If Don could put you flat on your back in two seconds, a little guy like Whitey would have been licked before he started. Right, Patsy. Well, this is the first time in my memory that a man has made a friend of me by knocking me down. How 
about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Well, Ralph, it's about a young fellow who wanted to buy his wife a diamond ring and almost bought himself a one-way ticket to the electric chair instead. And he completely ruined my new look, not to mention almost giving me pneumonia. Well, that was my fault. You see, Ralph, the only way I could keep Patsy from being shot was by pouring cold water on her. <laughs> Sounds as though you had a rough time, Patsy. Oh, I did. <laughs> uh, what do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it the case of the clue called X. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Ralph Camargo saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.